in chapter 17, oh, there you are. In chapter 17, it starts like this. Now after six days, Yeshua took Peter, James, and John, his brother, brought them up on a high mountain by themselves, and was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Now what does this remind us of? I think that this might remind us of when the law was given on Mount Sinai. Moses was taken up onto a mountain, and he uh, he wasn't necessarily transfigured, but while he was there, he was given the law to give to the children of Israel. And uh, something that Yeshua and Moses have in common here is that both of them, at some point in their lives, fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. No food, no water. That's pretty awesome. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Then Peter answered and said to Yeshua, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. <laughs> wow. But Yeshua came and touched them and said, Arise, and do not be afraid. You see, people falling on their faces and being greatly afraid, that happened frequently in the Bible. And uh, usually what was going on was there was a group of men or a man who was seeing a vision of an angel, or actually seeing an angel. And uh, the person would lay flat on his face, scared the bejesus out of him. And the angel would, usually nine times out of ten, if it was an angel, would say, Get up, don't bow to me. I'm like you, I'm just a servant of Yeshua. Now, what I would, <clears throat> excuse me, what I would like to say is that, um, I don't know if you ever heard the terms kolot and lapidim. Kolot and lapidim are Hebrew words, and that's what, fell on the people during Pentecost. It was kolot and lapidim. And it's also kolot and lapidim that occurs from the mountain. Most people think it's thunderings and lightnings, but that's not necessarily the case because some of the, those words can be a pun. It is uh, sparks and voices. And uh, we know all about sparks and voices, right? That's Pentecost. And what does Pentecost celebrate? Pentecost is celebrating the giving of the law on Mount Sinai. And what was happening at Mount Sinai? I believe it was Mount Sinai, and I believe it's the giving of the law. If I'm wrong, correct me in the comments. But what happened there? Kolot and Lapidim. It wasn't thunderings and lightnings. It was sparks and voices. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Yeshua only. Now as they came down from the mountain, Yeshua commanded them, saying, Tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then did the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And Yeshua answered and said to them, Elijah truly is coming first and will restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah has come already, and you did not know him, but did to him whatever they wished. Oh, and they did not know him, and did to him whatever they wished. Likewise, the Son of Man is also about to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he spoke to them of, of John the Baptist. Now, does that mean that John the Baptist and Elijah are exactly the same person? Who knows? It's a possibility. Does it mean that they had the same spirit? Who knows? That's also a possibility. Does it mean that the same angel or group of angels guided both of those men's lives to do very similar things, laying the foundation for the truth to come forth. That's also a possibility. That's something that you should be going to Yeshua in prayer so that you have another link in your relationship, strengthening your relationship with Him. Hallelujah. And when they had come in, and when they had come to the multitude, a man came to Him, kneeling down to Him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and suffers severely. For he often falls into the fire and often into water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. Then Yeshua answered and said, O oh, faithless and perverse generation, 
How long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Yeshua rebuked the demon, and he came out of him. And the child was cured from that very hour. There is a much better explanation of the point that is being made here in the book of Mark. And Yeshua rebuked the demon. Then the disciples came to Yeshua privately and said, Why could we not cast him out? So Yeshua said to them, Because of your unbelief. For assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. However, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. And what's the sort of thing that causes a man to spend his time praying and to suffer through fasting? I dare say... It's not unbelief, but faith in the belief. Now while they were staying in Galilee, Yeshua said to them, The Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And the third day he will be raised up. And they were exceedingly sorrowful. They were exceedingly sorrowful. It seemed like this sunk in, eh? It seemed like they knew what they were talk that what he was talking about. He outright he, he wasn't covering anything up. He wasn't speaking to them in parables or anything crazy like that. He straight up told them, I'm going to suffer, they're going to kill me, and then I'm going to be raised up on the third day. Not only is he saying this to them face to face, but this has been told to them through the scriptures in parables and allegories and uh, many, many other ways. It had a lot of life had been leading up <laughs> to this point. And yet when it happens, all of them are like, oh my gosh, he's dead. We're never going to see him again. And then when he's raised up, they don't, they don't believe it. <laughs> he told them straight up. That's nuts. And when they had come to Capernaum, those who received the temple tax came to Peter and said, does your teacher not pay the temple tax? He said, yes. And when he had come into the house, Yeshua anticipated him saying, what do you think, Simon? From whom do kings, do the kings of the earth take customs or taxes? From their own sons or from strangers? Peter said to him, From strangers. Yeshua said to him, Then the sons are free. Nevertheless, lest we offend them, go to the sea, cast in a hook, and take the fish that comes up first. And when you have opened its mouth, you will find a piece of money. Take that and give it to them for me and you. That's the end of chapter 17. If you have any uh, prayers for me, or any prayers that you have uh, that you'd like for me to pray for, leave them in the comments. That means a lot to me. And, uh, and if you feel that these videos are something that should be uh, spread out to many people, hit that like button and watch the videos all the way through. That lets the YouTube algorithm know that the uh, content that I'm putting out is uh, worthwhile and it'll sh start showing up a little bit more and more and more people will start to understand the same things. In this uh, verse 27, that hook being cast into the sea, that's the first and only time that fishing with a hook is mentioned during Yeshua's earthly ministry here as he's walking around as a man under the beggarly um, elements. All the other times when they're referring to fishing is using a net. And there are several different types of fishing nets. There's uh, drag nets and, uh, oh, what are they? There's three or four different ways of fishing. The fourth way is like basically spear fishing or harpooning. But there's uh, there's two different types of uh, nets where you, you cast them out, cast nets, you cast it out. And then there's another type of cast net that has multiple levels in it. It's really kind of a drag. <laughs> See what I did there? To use that type of uh, net. And then there's the drag net, which is the most common. And I've got a video that describes those nets. And I think it's in Matthew chapter, I guess is it's in Matthew chapter 3, because that's the one where he's talking about fishing. John the Baptist prepares the way, Satan tempts Yeshua. It's probably in chapter 4. Um, nope, probably in chapter 5. Wherever it is where he ends up, if you know where it is where he meets the, his disciples, the first two fishing, and then goes to another two disciples also fishing, in that video, that, that chapter, I describe what the different types of nets are and how they operate and how Yeshua uses fishermen, his disciples, to bring in a great catch. And then, um, and then what he does with those great catches is, is not only courageous and loving, but it's, it's also quite interesting how he handles those things.
In Yeshua, hallelujah, amen. Have an excellent day.